We have to let go of the old because we don't have control over that, but we do have control over what we do in these new aging bodies, these new old bodies. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> this is, is surprising us as much as it's surprising anyone else what happens to our bodies. I'm Cindy Darnell, and welcome to The Erotic Philosopher, the podcast where we examine and explore sex and relationships through social, cultural, political, and other lenses, and discover ways to solve some very diverse and stimulating erotic quandaries. Today's guest is Joan Price. Joan calls herself an advocate for ageless sexuality, but the media calls her a senior sexpert, the woman leading the sex revolution for seniors, and her favourite, The Wrinkly Sex Kitten. She's the author of four noteworthy books about sex and ageing, including the award-winning Naked at Our Age, Talking Out Loud About Senior Sex. Today, Joan and I will be discussing fulfilling sex at every age. Joan, thanks so much for coming on to The Erotic Philosopher. It's so great to have you here. Oh, Cindy, I'm honored to be invited. I love your work, and I respect you so much as a sex educator, and I love our history together. We always have great discussions about sex. Absolutely. The feeling is absolutely mutual. And for those of you listening who are new to perhaps myself and or Joan, we actually met when I was still living in Australia about... Was it four years ago or five years ago? It's in 2015. And we did a presentation on senior sex at the Wheeler Centre, which is a fabulous institution in Melbourne, dedicated to new ideas and literature. And we hosted a lunch there, which was just fabulous. And that's how Joan and I's uh, relationship started. And so it made perfect sense to me, Joan, to have you come on the show here and and really kind of going to spend the next sort of half hour to hour really getting into the nuts and bolts of sex that perhaps you wouldn't necessarily hear on other podcasts and you know knowing me the way you know me Joan you know I like to go deep and you know that not much scares me so we're a good team then we are a good team we're absolutely a good team so Joan before we get into today's topic I would really like to ask you How would you describe your work in your own words? Mm. I talk out loud about senior sex. That's the short answer. The slightly longer answer is that I uh, write and speak and give workshops and webinars and uh, do everything I can to educate people about older age sexuality, including educating seniors themselves, because so often... Those of us who grew up in the 50s, say, have bought into the old idea of uh, how sex was supposed to be, which doesn't serve us anymore. Mm. So I try to educate. I have a very small mission. I'm trying to change society's view of senior sex, one mind at a time. And I also (laughs) want to help seniors um, recapture or maintain their sexual pleasure. Hmm. And I, I'm curious, you know, when you first got into this work, in contrast to now, and, and maybe there's not been much of a change, but have you noticed changes in the way people respond to, to, to you and to the work? Oh, I absolutely have. I started this work 15 years ago with my first senior sex book, which was uh, Better Than I Ever Expected, Straight Talk About Sex After 60. I didn't know it would be my first senior sex book. I thought it would be my only senior sex book because I had no idea that I was about to embark on a whole field of work. I thought I just wanted to write this one book and, and celebrate senior sexuality. At the time when that book came out, there was, there were, the, the response was really two camps. One was the camp that said, Oh, thank you. Finally, we're talking out loud about this. Mm-hmm. And then the other camp was, and I will quote from my the first review of my book. It said, now that boomers have discovered their sex after 60, could they please stop writing about it? Ah, wow. Yeah, that was my, the first review I got for my book. 
And I was devastated. I thought, I bet this is how not only this book, but this topic and this population, this is how we're being received. Of course, my answer to that was, no, we're not going to stop. I've only just begun. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> the response I get now uh, for people who are discovering my work for the first time is they see me as part of an entire field mm. that's now talking out loud about senior sex. It doesn't seem so weird. I'm no longer a lone voice in the wilderness. There are lots of us doing this work we're all different, you know, we're not in competition with each other. We're yeah. cooperating with each other. We all have different ways we come to the work and different people we're trying to reach. But it isn't such an odd thing. I still get the the uh, backlash, but I can take it in stride now because I know where it's coming from. And I know that my work is reading, reaching the people it needs to reach. And so I can... <laughs> not take it personally the way I did in the beginning. Yeah. And so and when things get difficult, you know, like this person giving you this this, you know, awful review and and clearly not seeing the value of uh, and the relevance of sex for for anybody and especially for seniors. How how do you pull yourself through that? How do you keep yourself motivated in the face of stigma and in the face of the naysayers who are like, oh, well, you know, you're a past it or whatever the things that they say. What keeps you going? Two things. One is it's part of my personality that anytime anyone has said to me, and they have in the past all through my life, you can't do that. I, my response is watch me. <laughs> and then the other part and the more important part is the the feedback I get from the people who really needed the work that I have, mm. uh, the the, work, the education that I provide. I got two emails just in the last 24 hours of people thanking me and saying that uh, one of them said, your books changed my life. And then she went on to describe how she worked that into her own life and mm. it really changed her relationship. Another one said, um, your work gives me hope. Yeah. And especially with my most recent book, which is Sex After Grief. Yes. Such an important topic. I know. And that's a topic that crosses over so many age groups. Well, it does. This one yeah. wasn't specifically yeah. for seniors, though I emphasize seniors. I address mm. seniors the most because I don't want them to feel well, I'm in the background once again. Right. No, you're not. You're yeah. in the foreground. Yeah. And this is something that nobody's really written about at length in a positive way, in a sex positive way. So I feel honored to be doing this work. I feel honored that people are listening to me and reading me. And yeah, that's what keeps me going. I, I never feel tempted to stop. Mm. I just hope I'll live long enough for everything I want to do. Yeah, well, you're certainly one of the most spirited people I know, Joan. So I think you're going to be sticking around for a long time, whether you like it or not. I, I feel I feel it in my waters. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm 76 now, Cindy, so. <laughs> Amazing. So what's the most common issue you hear from seniors? The most common questions I get fall under the umbrella term of the old ways don't work the way they used to. Erections don't work the way they used to. Vaginas aren't accepting penises the way they used to. Orgasms are not as easy as they used to be. I can't get into the positions that I used to like the best. All of these used to. Uh, and, and of course, for every question, there's a different answer. But overall, what I want to convey is that for every problem, there is a solution. And the solution isn't going to be isn't going to look like what it used to. It's going to be a whole new way of enjoying sex and having fabulous sizzling sex that isn't exactly the way it used to be. So we need to open our minds to new ways of, of finding pleasure that aren't the way they used to 
be. Yeah, yeah. We have to let go of the old because the because we don't have control over that, but we can we do have control over what we do in these new aging bodies, these new old bodies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Cuz this is is surprising us as much as it's surprising anyone else what happens to our bodies. Yeah, I mean I've even noticed in my own body since to, uh, to after turning 40 what's changed. And it's it's confronting. It's really confronting. So, and even for me, who's you know a very out and proud sex person, I'm even like, oof, no one prepared me for this. You know, I'm coping, just you know, to be clear. But I I am like, wow, this I did not expect these things to be coming. Just the physiological changes are uh, they're confronting. One of our listeners, Joan has written in a letter and it's really specific to your skill set. So would it be okay if I shared that letter with you? I'd love that. Dear philosophers, I'm a 68 year old male who passionately loves sex. The trouble is my wife of over 40 years does not. She couldn't care less for it. I enjoy watching her in sexy underwear and heels, the works. If I could have sex with her every day, I would. But She tells me the shoes hurt her and she doesn't have the energy for my passions. After years in a sexless marriage, I just couldn't take it any longer. So several years ago, I met someone online. She's 65 and she loves sex as much as me. When my wife found out, she was furious. She kicked me out of the house and my kids have turned against me. So now I live with my girlfriend. I still see the family every week for family dinner, but it's just not like it was. The trouble is that I love my wife and my girlfriend. They both bring so much joy to my life, but living a sexless life nearly killed me. And now living a sex full life is costing me my family. Please help. So that's from Charles, Joan. I really feel for Charles. I mean, before we get into what I think, I want to know, what's your impression of this situation with Charles? There's so much in that very sad letter. Uh, I and, and I hope we can discuss all the parts of it. Overall, I think it's very, very sad that he's in this situation. And there, I don't know how to advise him right now. I wish I could have advised him before mm. he made the change. Mm. If he had asked us for help at that point, I would have said, first of all, talk to your wife honestly. Right. And say, first of all, are you? do you feel done with sex because you feel it's all been about me, the things I want? Are there some things you've wanted? What If we had sex for a month and it was only the way you wanted it Mm. what would that look like no high heels no my request just how can i pleasure you Mm. and maybe that would have led to something really different if it didn't though if it led to i just don't want sex with you anymore i'm done with it then maybe the conversation needed to go with then how can i stay in this marriage and still get my sexual needs fulfilled. Right. How would you give me a hall pass to embark in another relationship and stay married to you? If if so, what would that look like? What boundaries do you want? What? Um, how would you mm. want it to play out? If what you want is that I just give up my sex life because you don't want sex with me, I can't do that. Can we go to a counselor? Can we see if we have some common ground? Mm -hmm. Is there a way that you and I could have a companionate relationship, which means that we are together, we we are in love, we are living together, but we are not having sex, but I can find sex outside the relationship. Yeah. Once we went, once they went on though to the next stage of him finding someone else, she found out about it. That should not have been a secret between them. Yeah. I mean, secrets poison a relationship unless they agreed, you can get your needs met, but I don't want to know about it. What do you think about what I've said so far, Cindy? Yeah, I think it's spot on. I completely agree with you. And I think it's a great distinction that you've made about 
you know, if we could turn back time, which obviously we cannot. But for folks who might be listening, who might be in a very similar situation, if you're feeling this longing or this urge to want to um, either increase the frequency of sex in your partnership or increase the quality of the sex in your partnership, I agree with you, Joan. The only way we can do this is to talk about it and to talk about what would satisfying sex potentially be like for you satisfying as opposed to satisfactory you know because satisfactory could be you know oh so so mediocre and if you've only been having mediocre sex perhaps that's what your partner thinks is that sex has been mediocre so we don't know what his wife was thinking why she wanted to stop having sex with him and I mean I, I wonder through a lens of being a senior if there is how much of that um social pressure and social stigma that, you know, ladies of a certain age don't do that anymore. Could that have been the reason that she didn't want to have sex? So there's a lot of mystery there for us to unravel about, well, why why did she stop having sex with him? Was she not enjoying it? Was it hurting her? And I love what you said, you know, about let's not make it about the shoes. If it was just a month on your terms, what would that look like? I think that's a great question. And Cindy, I hear from many people, usually men who say that their wives don't want sex anymore. And often, if I hear from the wives, which I usually don't, but when I do, it's usually that intercourse is no longer comfortable or satisfying or maybe never was. Right. That's the issue, that sex has become all about the erection, often um, medically yeah. induced, and and that the, the woman who needs more stimulation at this time to become aroused and to reach orgasm than she ever did, that's one yeah. of the things that happens with us as we age, is we often, not always, but often, need much more stimulation, much more arousal. Orgasms are more mm -hmm. difficult to achieve. So we need someone who is focused on what ha what brings us pleasure and arousal mm. and orgasm. And if the partner, if they're not communicating well, which clearly this couple was yeah. not communicating well, then they may not go on this journey together. They may be going on it separately and may find that there's such a divide in the past yeah. that they need that they just don't don't recapture what they used to have. And one of the problems is I hear myself saying that they're not really looking for what they used to have, they're looking for what it will be going forward. Yes, I think that is such an important distinction because it sounds like, you know, Charles is still in the, the orbit of the family, like he's been kicked out, but he's not, you know, excommunicated. He's still coming back for weekly dinners and things. So, I mean, it would be, it's, it's sort of, I guess, difficult for us to hypothesize about what Charles should or shouldn't do given that we can't talk to his wife and his girlfriend now. I mean, she needs to be included in this process too because her feelings, you know, to my mind are also as important, you know, so we can't be just casting her out either. Absolutely. And are they living together out of a sort of a, well, he's kicked out of the house, I guess she, he has to come here because this our new relationship is what kicked him out of the house. Yeah. I think if... You know, again, if we could rewind and not get him kicked out of the house and he could con continue to see this new girlfriend, establish what that relationship yes. can be while still keeping his marriage and keeping his emotional focus on the yes. marriage as well. You can love two people at the same time. He says he does. And I, I believe, believe him, him too. You yeah. certainly can. What, I mean, just as a slight sidetrack from that, in your experience, I mean, in my experience, um, working primarily with kind of millennial and, and Generation X folks and a handful of boomers, but the majority of my clients are millennials and Gen Xs, where open relationships and polyamory are very common and, and you know, almost de rigueur. What do you notice amongst uh, the boomers, the, the general responses to, to non-monogamous approaches to relationships, especially in light of things like this, where people have been married for 40 years. Let's expand boomers to include, let's say boomers and elders. Okay. 
the whole for me those two terms encompass seniors they may not for everyone listening they may go no 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 i don't call myself a senior I'm yeah, only yeah. No, that's good. 60 yeah. you know but if you're if you're 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 that's the population i work with it's it's an odd thing because the people who are older than boomers were brought up with um with sex is bad until you're married and then you'll instantly want it and it will be very satisfying through intercourse only because that's the real way to have sex. And of course you will be faithful until death do you part because otherwise, you know, that's, that's how we were brought up. The boomers may have been brought up with that upbringing, but the boomers rejected it. Right. The sexual revolution was led by boomers. Whether they're rejecting what they were brought up with extended into rejecting the notion of lifetime monogamy well then that's right. a different issue some people very happily spread their wings somewhere during their their marriage or their relationship their part their their yeah. committed relationship many did and many did not so there's no really one way that boomers responded to this. Some people, interestingly, in their 50s and 60s start spreading their wings who didn't before. Mm. People who married young and who bought into the fidelity until death and then realized, you know, that we need to revisit that because that that was what worked for us when we were 20. But now that we're 50 or 60, and things are changed and we have different wants. One of us maybe has more desire than the other. One of us wants to be more sexually active than the other. How can we not restrict each other, but still remain committed? And maybe we can do that by looking at opening our relationship. For other people, they'd go, no, death first. Yeah, and that's the thing. And I think, you know, when I'm talking with couples, you know, in my practice about this kind of stuff, I will never give a prescriptive answer. I'll be more inclined to say, well, according to what you've told me, according to your values, according to your, uh, you know, your spiritual beliefs, your cultural beliefs, your what you think matters in the world, what helps you sleep at night. It sounds to me like your options are this, 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 and this. Oh, you're so can wise. You, can you think of anything else that we may have missed? And they'll be like, no, no, that's 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 how it seems to. Oh, okay, so these are your options. This is not meant to be a commercial for you, but my gosh, I want to send all of the people who write to me to you. Oh, thank you, darling. Please do. <laughs> do, you, do you do? Do you do I online counseling? Do. I, I mean, I have clients all over the world. So, um, you know, that's one of my superpowers is being available across the planet now with this fabulous technology that we have and and because there are so few um sexologists and psychotherapists who can work in these spaces who are comfortable dealing with the murky depths of the of the erotic and the murky depths of being confronted with stuff like you know how do i how, how do i unpack my eroticism in the face of a 40-year marriage because there are so many sharp corners on a question like that or it feels like there is there may not necessarily be when you have the tools to unpack it like we're unpacking it now and poor charles obviously made the decisions that he made without some of the resources that you and i have you know to be able to talk about this that if he could go back in time and prime his wife differently to have these kinds of conversations, he may have been able to have his wife and his girlfriend or just his wife or just his girlfriend. Who knows? I mean, they could, there's so many options that, that, that could have come from this. Right. So given that Charles just wrote you now, what would you tell him now? How would you get him started in f either acting or feeling or somehow changing w w the sadness in him? Well, because he's saying, you know, I love my wife and I love my girlfriend. They both offer me so much. So I think, you know, in, even in the tone of the language that he uses, his focus is quite squarely on himself. That's one thing that I did notice about what he was saying, which makes me think, 
how you know how well versed is he at asking these women in his life what they want of him what they expect of him what they are hoping for from him so we don't know anything about you know what his girlfriend I mean we know that she loves sex according to him I can assume that she loves the kind of sex that he loves with the high heels and the various accoutrements which is great but we don't really know how much else you know what she's getting out of it what her motivations are and likewise for his ex-wife does she want to get back together with him it certainly sounds like he wants to get back together with her and I, I guess I'm also curious as to what role how much of a role sex played in their marriage previously was it was it always a bit dormant and he just got tired of waiting after 40 years so there are really so many things so I would I would actually really like to sit down with Charles and get answers to those questions before I would guide him in any direction. And I would really like to teach him how to think in a much broader view about this situation rather than how can I only get my own erotic needs met? How can I create a context to invite these women who I love, who bring me so much joy and pleasure into a space where we can at least have a discussion about what a, a good outcome might look like for all of us. That is something that I would like to perhaps encourage Charles to think about. I absolutely agree with you. One thing I think we should be careful of is to not, uh, we don't want our listeners to think that we are branding Charles no. as selfish. He's the one who wrote the letter, so he's the one that w was talking mm. about his own experience. But we don't know what the two exactly. women want. Yeah. We know what they don't. We know what the wife doesn't want. We don't know what she yeah, does Yeah, exactly. Want. And that's the thing. And, and being able to, I mean, when you're writing a letter, you are writing from your own experience. And yeah, and that's, a, and that's exactly the thing. And being able to then take that experience and to, to develop some curiosity to think, well, yeah, what, I wonder what my wife wants. And I wonder what my girlfriend wants. What are their expectations? What are they hoping for? from from being in a relationship with me do they even want that well i'm assuming that the girlfriend does i don't know about the wife i the girlfriend though that relationship may be still in the throes of what we call new relationship right. energy and mm. re which means that when for the benefit of the listeners that when a relationship is in its newest stage the brain chemicals that fire are the lust chemicals and the arousal chemicals and and so it's very likely that a relationship he moved into a new relationship before really getting past that yeah. stage into what it would mm. be long term and he made some decisions that uh might not work out long term we do we know how long he's been in the new relationship no and i don't know how long they had been seeing each other before his wife found out so i mean in addition to uh, all of the sex stuff there's also his wife's feelings of you know she was furious was i think the word he used so you know we don't know what precipitated that what what how she you know is she still furious um, and also the kids turning against him. I mean, that's a, that's a whole other thing that's perhaps outside of our wheelhouse. But people can get very involved, I think, in other people's intimate affairs. And, and I think one of the things that I tend to do in working with couples where an affair has been had um, is to be very selective about who finds out solely because everybody has an opinion and everybody wants to put in mm. their five cents worth. And because it's such a, a sensitive kind of moral issue, you can end up getting so much information and so much advice that sends you off in different directions that ultimately is not always helpful because I think in these situations, your own moral compass and your own ethics have to guide you, including the degree to which you think sex is important, which I think it's extremely important. And I encourage people and say, well, it is, if sex is, is important to you, it's okay to make that one of your core values. It's not lesser than or lower than any of the others. I think sometimes sex tends to be discarded because it's this base emotion when actually it's one of the most important things in the world to some people. Yes. And could we, I, I don't know if this is unorthodox, but could we give some advice to people who might be in the wife's situation? Absolutely. Because uh, I'm thinking 
if she and I hear from many people who are at the on the husband's side of what happened, uh, if she decides unilaterally, I don't want sex anymore. That shouldn't be the end of the conversation. That really needs to be the beginning of a lot of conversations where she would examine both to herself and to the spouse that she's decided is not going to have sex with her anymore. What is it that I'm dissatisfied with? What would satisfy me? Is there a way we can keep yeah. sex in our lives that I would love, not just tolerate, but I would love? Is there a way? And if there is not, if there really is not, if, if she is one of the people, and there are these people who would say, you know, I never really liked it. I endured it. I'm not going to endure it anymore. Yeah. I'm just yeah. not. I'm yeah. too old to care. I don't want to. So then the conversation needs to start. So what will you, um, what will you do to accommodate your husband's needs does do you need to end the marriage it, just to say that he should also go along with this no sex ever again that's not realistic and that's yeah, not loving right. you know how can you love someone and say you need to um you need to sever your need for sex uh, that's that's cruel and and not realistic anyway absolutely and then and then if you acknowledge, I can't tell you that you can't ever have sex again, then what do you need from him? Do you need to say, but please do it. Just, if you go outside the marriage, do it discreetly and safely. Use condoms. Don't, don't go out in public where I will, where my friends will tell me you were seen. Yeah. So establishing some, some ground rules. And I have worked with a lot of couples who wouldn't necessarily call themselves polyamorous or non-monogamous even, but they have actively adopted a sort of a bit of a don't ask, don't tell policy where they have some ground rules, as you say, about health, making sure that you use condoms, making sure that, that you know, you're keeping it out of the view of various community members. And they've, they've made a work around that way. So there are, there are multiple ways I think that we can, we can do this and and still keep the spirit of the primary relationship intact if that's something that matters to people. And if she was open to this kind of, I see it as growth, she might want to say, I want to know the person you're having sex with. I don't want you going with random people. So yes, establish a relationship that would not in any way be threatening to mm. ours which might need, mean I need to talk to this person you've chosen. I need to meet this person you've chosen. I need to hear from her. I'm not trying to break up your marriage. You know, I, I know people and I personally have been in relationships like that. Where you've been the girlfriend. I've been the girlfriend by consent. Yes. Yeah. And that's the really biggest the thing here. There's the consent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was in one relationship where before anything started, just when we were talking about it, person, I'm going to use non-gendered pronouns for this, person A um, was not getting the sex they needed from, pers from a long time committed person B. They had been living together for more than two decades. And one of them was older. Person B was older than person A, and person B had decided, I just don't want sex that often. Every other week is fine with me. And person A had a very strong libido and was saying, oh my God, it just kills me to go a week. And so their solution was to enlist me <laughs> ah. As their, because I knew both of them. Right. I was closer to person A. We'd been friends for, for oh, for 10 years. And we knew each other uh, non-sexually, in but socially. And we also confided in each other. We were good friends. And so person A said, would you sit down with person B? Can we, if you would be interested in a sexual relationship that was just friends with benefits. We add the benefits to the friendship we already have. And person, if, if person B would agree, if we would listen to person B's terms, mm -hmm. and if those are acceptable to both of us, 
could we explore this? Right. And I had never thought of person A in a sexual way. Ah, I'd only okay. known them as, you know, this is person A who is um, with person B. Yeah. And But we sat down together in a living room and person B dictated the terms. Oh. It can happen only in this way. Okay. Not in our bed. In fact, not in our town. Right. Oh, okay. Only, that's, right. that's some pretty big rules. You you. I would tolerate it, knowing that you will You, I know you have no interest in taking person A away from me. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. I know you. I want to hear you say it, yeah. but I know that. Yeah. But you're going to have to go. You're going to have to travel. You're going to have to go to a hotel out of our town, mm -hmm. so that no one in our town is going to see you. Right. And and I agreed. And this was a relationship that went on for oh about a year. Okay. Until we decided, okay. We, we don't need that anymore, it ran its but course. this was nice. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, hearing things like that is, it, it, you know, that's really for me what so much of this work is about. So, you know, what this podcast is about, giving people options, allowing people to know that there is not one true way, there is not one right path. I mean, we would all agree that consent is a desired path. And within that, we can go in any direction at all. That that sex and relationships and love have so many faces if we give ourselves permission to explore them. I, I think that's so important. And the communication, of course, you'll agree, is the prime part of this, that people who don't express their needs or don't know how to express their needs in a way that doesn't put their partner off. We, don't, we aren't taught to talk about sex. And that's, I think, one of the big things is the fear that a lot of people hold back from being frank with their partners because of the fear that it's going to have a negative outcome because we tend we tend to see relationships through a very black and white lens. We tend to see sex through a very black and white lens. We're either, you know, together or we're not. We're having sex or we're not. And that there's no scope for the area in between and consistently this is what I see and also my own lived experience. This is what corrodes relationships when you're always corralled into, you know, you're with me or you're against me, you're in or you're out. It's like, oof, that's very, very hard for a relationship to thrive under those conditions. And also we don't expand the notion of what sex is when yeah. we talk about it. We don't like the this this couple um, for for Charles, it was a a fantasy with high heels mm. and, yeah, yeah. and outfits. You know, I could see, sure, why not? Except she did it for him. What did he do for her in return? I don't. We don't know. Yeah, we don't know. So many unanswered questions there, Joan. It's been fantastic. It's always fantastic. Oh my God, we have to stop. I could talk to you all day. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to start slowly winding down. and then... We have only just begun. <laughs> I know, darling. I know. Well, we'll have to have you back again for another uh, another session and another erotic quandary. I'd like that. Where can people find you? If they want to hear, I don't know, who wouldn't want to hear more from you? How can people find you? What are your offerings? What's, how, do you, how do people contact you? The best way to find me is to go to my website, which is joanprice.com. Under the website, you'll find everything about my books, my webinars. You can sign up for my newsletter. Uh, you can connect with me on Facebook and Twitter. You can read my blog, which, uh, as you mentioned, has been going for a very long time. I review sex toys from a senior perspective and have lots of other news and views there. That's fantastic. JoanPrice.com. So, Joan, it's been an absolute delight to catch up with you again and I always look forward to seeing you I definitely want to invite you back onto the podcast because yeah you and I can go on about this for hours and hours and hours <laughs> well Cindy you are one of my favorite sex educators and I delight in talking to you and learning from you and uh, sharing with you absolutely thanks darling it's a pleasure
Hello, listeners. To submit an erotic quandary for the philosophers to ponder, follow the Erotic Philosopher on Instagram and Twitter at the Erotic Philos. That's P H I L O S, and click on the Google Form link in the bio. And to discover more about my online sexology courses as well as how to work with me directly, head on over to CindyDarnell.com. That's C Y N D I D A R N E L L.com. Thanks for listening.